from Kashmir to Balochistan to religious minorities, is Pakistan willing to take responsibility for its human rights abuses? I'll ask the human rights minister in Imran Khan's government. Shireen Mazari, thank you for joining me on Upfront. You're the human rights minister in a government that is perhaps the world's number one critic of Indian government human rights abuses in Kashmir, abuses that we've covered on this show very recently. But what about Pakistan's own contribution to that human rights crisis in Kashmir? Uh, you've backed armed groups like Jesh e Muhammad and Lashkar e Taiba that have killed civilians, that have engaged in torture, that have ethnically cleansed Kashmiri Hindus. That's all undeniable, isn't it? It's absolutely deniable. We have not done any ethnic cleansing of Hindus. In fact, the pundits were removed specifically from Jammu for a while to try and create the situation. Secondly, I think nobody in the world still believes that the Kashmir struggle in occupied Kashmir is not indigenous. It is very much an indigenous struggle. Generation after generation has died fighting to liberate themselves from Indian occupation. The siege now and the lockdown by the occupation forces in uh, uh, occupied Kashmir. It's now 121 days. And, and we've, covered, we've, we've covered the lockdown extensively. So, I'm just wondering, you can still have an indigenous freedom movement while also having Pakistan support violent groups like Jesh e Muhammad and Lashkar e Taiba. You don't deny, even your prime minister has admitted that your country in the past has backed some pretty vicious groups. We have backed, yes, in the past, we have backed some. Uh, freedom fighters, and we have bagged groups supporting those freedom fighters. That was a long time ago. And that is nothing. And you can't compare the human rights abuses by an occupation force and the violence that that has led to, led by indigenous Kashmiris struggling you, for you their say, right to You say indigenous Kashmiris, but didn't the leader of Jesh e Muhammad take responsibility for an attack on Indian security forces in February that almost led to war between your two countries? He did that while allegedly sitting in a Pakistani military hospital bed. He's coordinating attacks on India from Pakistan. You know very well that the uh, Pulwama attack was a false flag operation deliberately to try and drag Pakistan into what India had already planned, which was, of course, the lockdown, the annexation on 5th of August of occupied uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir. And we know that India was going to do this illegal action, and the Indians wanted to detract attention. And the whole, they still have not really established who was behind the Pulwama attack. We have asked them for evidence. You say false flag, but the UN committee, which blacklist terror groups, uh, blacklisted Jesh e Muhammad earlier this year, or tried to blacklist uh, the group earlier this year, you know that they've claimed responsibility for that attack. And you also know that the Financial Action Task Force, which is one of the world's leading global financial watchdogs based in Paris, says, has said repeatedly this year that your government, it's not just the past, your government today is not doing enough to curb terrorism financing and money laundering inside of Pakistan. That's what the Financial Action Task Force says. Are they wrong? We are complying with most of the demands of the Financial Action Task Force, but you also know very well that one of the members of the FTF is India, and so we are having this serious problem, and we have protested and objected to India's presence because that politicizes what should not be a political issue. And our government is not only compliant, we are supporting, we are trying to improve our uh, uh, sort of You structures. say improve and comply. They say you've only uh, uh, complied with five of the 27 action items they've asked you to take on terrorism and money laundering. Let's just talk about Kashmiri independence. You, you talk about no, Kashmir no, freedom, no, no. occupation. Have, okay, let, yes, yes. Okay, clarify. please briefly respond to that. The Financial Action Task Force has not moved Pakistan away from the grey area. We are cooperating with them. They have accepted that. And I think the general impression is that despite India's political attempts, we will be coming out of this quagmire of the FATF. You mentioned indigenous freedom movement in Kashmir, but it's not as if your government, Pakistan, is offering Kashmiris freedom, is it? In Pakistani-administered Kashmir, uh, known as Azad Kashmir in your country, which means free or independent Kashmir, 
The politicians are forced to sign a declaration there saying, quote, I solemnly declare that I believe in the ideology of Pakistan, the ideology of the state's accession to Pakistan, and the integrity and sovereignty of Pakistan. That doesn't sound like freedom or independence for the Kashmiris there. They're locked into your country and your government. It's, listen, this is the part of Kashmir that liberated itself from Indian occupation and declared that it was going to link up with Pakistan one. It is not an occupied territory. If you compare and read international... But it's not free either, law, is it? It's not free. It's not independent. They have, their, they have their parliament. They have their elections. And if it's part of their uh, uh, constitution to sign this um, declaration. And we have said, in fact, we have not even formalized our border with China. The 1963 border agreement between Pakistan and China clearly declared that the final settlement would be after the issue of Kashmir is resolved. So we have recognized... But just to be clear, that just to be clear, are you offering Kashmiris independence, yes or no? Is the Pakistani government offering Kashmiris independence? We are independence? offering them... We have said we will support whatever they want, but we need to have the plebiscite under the UN supervision. But the UN plebiscite, as you know, the Shireen Mazari, the UN plebiscite does not have an independence question on it. It says, join India or Pakistan. I'm answering. But Would you add a yes, question on independence? But we, but we are very clear. We will give them the right of plebiscite. And if they want to include that uh, choice as well, if the Kashmiris want it, we have no issue. But give them the right to... Uh, the plebiscite and self-determination. Okay. The Indian government says you have no credibility when it comes to criticising their actions in Kashmir, given your own actions in Balochistan, your country's biggest province, where the Pakistani government has dealt with a decades-long insurgency by killing, abducting, torturing thousands of people, even today. Listen, India knows, one, that Indian-occupied Kashmir is an internationally recognised dispute between India and Pakistan on the UN Security Council agenda. So one, Balochistan is an integral part of Pakistan. Secondly, we have an elected government in Balochistan. The province makes its choices. So there's absolutely no comparison. And uh, India... You say, you say absolutely no comparison. First of all, you say it's an integral part of our country. That's exactly what India says. You blame India for supporting no, no, Balochi insurgents. That's what India says about Pakistan not... in Kashmir. And just, sorry, on the facts, the Voice of Baloch Missing Persons Organization, you must know it, the VBMP, they say that since 1948, Pakistan has, quote, been killing people and throwing dead bodies. They say 45,000 people have been killed or abducted by Pakistani security forces. Those are Pakistani citizens saying this, by the way. I, I am... Well, a lot of them are not Pakistani citizens. They're living abroad and being funded from abroad. That's a different... Well, Mama Khadir is based in Balochistan, who's one of the actors. Yes, exactly. And if you had updated your information, we have now prepared a bill for against enforced disappearances. We have a commission which is focusing on checking out enforced disappearances headed by a civilian. And that anybody can complain. And if there is a problem, it will be dealt with within the law of the land. But the fact of the matter is that the Yadev case where the Indian spy was arrested revealed Indian actions in Balochistan. The man has confessed... Shiri, Shiri Mazari, do you understand? So a, do you, no, no, but do you understand how this sounds to let a global me. audience watching this? They hear an Indian politician come yes. on this show a few weeks ago and say, Pakistan is behind everything bad in Kashmir. Then they hear you come on this show and say, India is behind everything that is bad in Balochistan. It's a mirror image. No, I'm not, I am not saying India is behind everything that is bad in Balochistan, but certainly acts of terrorism in Balochistan have been aided and abetted by India. They it's say the too, same about by you. By the Indian spy that we have. No, I'm talking about Yadev, but what you're not understanding, or you're the world, if they don't want to, it's different. Occupied Kashmir is recognized as an occupied disputed It's recognized as a disputed territory, not as an occupied territory by the UN, just to be clear. It's not a disputed territory between India and... But it is a place where, so as you yourself say, there are enforced disappearances. You told me a moment ago that you're passing a bill to stop enforced disappearances, which suggests that you know that there I'm are enforced not, disappearances I'm, going on there. I am not That's a human rights abuse, and you're the only, human rights yes. minister. And that is what I'm saying. I'm not referring only to Balochistan. Of course, there have been cases of enforced disappearances. I'm not denying that. We've had military rule also. And therefore, we've had these incidences. But we recognize it. And we are dealing with it. 
and we have institutions where you can go and complain. And what I'm trying to say is there's a basic difference between an occupied territory yes, recognized you made that as point. Dispute, you made that and, point. I get it. So there is no comparison. There are lots of other things I can discuss about India. Okay. Well, uh, we're, we're going to run out of time. So, And we're not here to talk about India. We're here to talk about Pakistan. Just sticking with your portfolio, which is human rights. Um, a lot of people around the world look at Pakistan's pretty draconian and barbaric blasphemy laws. It's something I discussed with Imran Khan when he was on this show a couple of years ago. Some Pakistani politicians have tried to change them. They got killed for speaking out against your blasphemy laws. Do you understand why those laws leave religious minorities in your country like Christians and Shias and Hindus and Ahmadis feeling still persecuted, demonized, targeted, excuse harassed? Me, excuse me. First, Shias are not a minority. We are Muslims. I'm a Shia myself, and I'm part of the Muslim population of Pakistan. So at least let's be clear on when we talk about minorities, you're But the Shia community is an oppressed minority. minority community in Pakistan. Not at all. Not at all. Absolutely Really? There, not. Haven't, been, there haven't been killings of Shia professionals? No. There haven't been disappearances no. of Hazara Shias in Balochistan? There hasn't been there a sectarian been, campaign of hate? There, there been, haven't been suicide bomb attacks in Shia there mosques? Been sectarian We've just imagined violence. all that? There has been sectarian violence against both sects, one attacking the other. But to say that the Shias are a minority is factually incorrect. We are Muslim citizens and we are not in the minority. Coming now to the non-Muslim citizens, yes, there have been problems, but now the Supreme Court has set a very good precedence that false accusations on blasphemy charges will be punishable and those who do it will be punishable. And for the first time, just to bring you up to date, a blasphemy case was registered against Muslims who tried to destroy a Hindu temple in sin. So, I mean, there are issues. We are learning to deal with it. And by the way, we are one of the few countries of the world where our minorities, non-Muslim citizens, have their own personal laws. We have the Hindu Marriage and Divorce Act. We now, so what I'm saying is, there are things happening in See, You have, of course, the Ahmadis who are in a tricky situation because you say they're not Muslims. They say they are Muslims. Here's what an Ahmadi spokesman said this year under your government. He said, Ahmadis have no religious freedoms in Pakistan and recent actions taken by the authorities mean that the situation is going to deteriorate further and make it impossible for Ahmadis to carry on with their everyday lives. That was just six, seven months ago under your okay, government. Let me listen. The Ahmadis, according to our constitution now, are non-Muslims. They have every right to uh, uh, come into politics, to contest elections on non-Muslim seats. They have every right to practice their religion. As, but we don't... Yes, they have to declare themselves non-Muslim in order to participate in Pakistani public life. Some would say that's a form of they apartheid. Have, no, not to participate in public life, but yes when we have to sign a form declaring accepting the finality of the prophet, peace be upon him, and those who don't, by our constitutional definition, are non-Muslims. So there is no denial of their political rights. But if they insist that our constitution is wrong and they want us to change that, then I'm afraid that that creates problems. You say there's no so denial of rights. You say there's no denial of rights. On this show back in 2016, when I asked Imran Khan, your prime minister, if he would extend equal rights to Ahmadis, he said, and I quote, all human beings have equal rights. Anyone who is a Pakistani has an equal right. Yet shortly after he was elected to office last year, Princeton University economist Atif Mian, who had been selected to serve on the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, was asked to step down because he's an Ahmadi. Why didn't the Prime Minister stand by him? Why didn't you stand by him if everyone has equal rights in Pakistan? A, he was not in Pakistan. He was in the US. So let's be very clear. When you say equal rights, you have equal rights under the Constitution. You want to bring about constitutional changes. There are many constitution, constitutional changes which may improve the country. With the, the 18th Amendment, we have now power devolved, so bringing about any change becomes ever more difficult at the centre. But I agree the Atif Mia case was unfortunate, and there was a lot of debate. Unfortunate or discriminatory? No, I think that it is the choice of the government, finally, but I think that it should have been 
dealt with in a better way. And the fact of the matter is that the, uh, it, it should not have been done in the way it was done. If you knew it would become controversial, we should never have taken that decision in the first place. The gentleman is not in Pakistan. He's been living in the States. So it's not that he was being denied a right to be part of the government in Pakistan. He was being asked to be an advisor. And I think that it would have been good because he was he's one of the leading economists. Okay, but, but he was targeted the, because he was Ahmadi. No, the controversy was created needlessly, and I think that it could have been handled better. But he was not denied any right because, A, he was uh, he was being asked to come as an advisor on a uh, sort of a pro bono capacity. Shireen Mazari, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. From worldwide protests over corruption and inequality to the popularity of socialist politicians like Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, it's hard to get away from the idea that there's something very wrong with the global economic system. Even billionaires and business leaders talk openly about capitalism being broken. So, is it really on the way out? Or are reports of capitalism's demise much exaggerated? Grace Blakely is an economics commentator at the New Statesman magazine in London and author of the new book, Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. Uh, Diego Zuluaga is a financial policy analyst at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., a libertarian and free market think tank. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Um, how much are the recent protests that we've seen around the world in Latin America and the Middle East as well as the rise of politicians like Jeremy Corbyn, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, how much of all of that is about the explicit failure of capitalism to protect workers, uh, to share the proceeds of growth, to reduce inequality? Grace? I think specifically when you're looking at what's going on in Latin America at the moment, when you're looking at the massive pushback against these you know, international institutions that for decades have been implicit in foisting, or actually actively involved in foisting a very particular... Um, economic and political order on nations that simply, you know, democratically have rejected many of those policies. That is a significant source of, uh, of instability in many of those states. It's hardly surprising that people who are basically losing the right to vote to have a say over their economy are really getting angry about this stuff. When you actually look at the countries that are seeing protests, though, it's interesting because some of the countries that have the most virulent protests right now are the ones that have been most prosperous in the last three decades. Chile is by far the richest economy in Latin America. Inequality there has gone down, which hasn't happened, for example, in Venezuela. Uh, it's opened up and liberalized massively. It has trade agreements all so over the world. it's not economic discontent that's driving these protests in your I opinion. don't think it's primarily economic discontent, not discontent reflected by the figures anyway. In your new book, Stolen, you say, quote, we are currently living through the death throes of finance-led growth. What do you mean by that? So in the book, I talk about this idea of finance-led growth being um, a kind of model according to which economies, particularly in the global north, have been governed for a long time. It's kind of an institutional arrangement that privileges the interests of a small class. Basically, corporations become financialized. They're far more focused on their standing in Wall Street, the city, financial markets, and they will do anything to kind of boost their short-term share price, even at the expense of long-term investment and paying their workers. Um, and but death, that throws death is a very strong phrase. Well, I mean, you know, it takes a, lo a, a while for systems, economic and political systems, to break down, and we are seeing the cracks. I don't, I don't see this. the breakdown, Grace. I have to say, you know, you look over the last thirty years, and the big story of the last thirty years is a massive, massive reduction in extreme poverty, primarily driven by two things. One, since the late nineteen seventies, China opening up to the world which had 900 million poor at the time that it opened up, and now has less than 100 million, still 100 million too many, but a massive improvement. And then since the 90s, India doing the same thing. That's the dramatic story of the last 30 years. Now, in terms of indebtedness in developed countries and increasing inequality within developed countries, that is a phenomenon that I am concerned about, and one that is, I think, driven a lot of the time by regulatory restrictions that benefit the people who own assets at the expense of everybody else. But you look at the developing world, and inequality globally has actually gone down. The, it is happening. The, tr the China case is really interesting, right? Because the way that China has got to the position it's in today is by breaking all the rules that those international institutions would want to impose on it. It has had capital controls. It's had exchange controls. It has mass state ownership of many of the most important institutions in, um, in the economy, mass state ownership of, of the banking system, of you know, big enterprises. Much less than it used to which be. Has, yeah, but that is why it's been able to weather the storm, whereas I disagree. other countries the, the main, the main have not been able The main to. driver has been foreign direct investment from other countries and the fact that foreign capital could move in. The main driver of China's growth over the last 10 years has been state investment. In fact, that's basically been the only... Right, but the, but the last... 
isn't that the last ten years is the smallest bit of this whole period. But right? Diego, I want to put a point to you. Isn't the problem for your way of looking at the world that it's not just socialists or people on the left uh, who are saying capitalism has major problems, whether it's inequality or stagnant growth? It's also the International Monetary Fund, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank. Hardcore capitalist institutions are saying this stuff. There's yeah, not some well, left-wing plot. No, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a left-wing plot, but I think the narrative has to be differentiated here. It, there's a difference between pointing out specific problems with the global economy right now, yeah. and I think there are plenty of them, but I think most of the time they're driven by misguided interventions by specific national governments, uh, whereas the trend and the general adoption of free markets around the world in the last 30 years, there is no question that it's improved the welfare. Well, hold, hold on, hold on. Worst of all. On that note, when and, hedge fund um, billionaire Ray Dalio, for example, says capitalism yeah. must evolve or die, that it's not working for the majority of people, do you agree with him? No, I don't, actually. No, I think, the, as I say, the main driver, what we want to eradicate is situations where people cannot satisfy their basic necessities and cannot uh, flourish in a humane way around the world. And I think we haven't had a period in the history of the world, like the last 30 years, in which the vast majority of the global population, even in the most deprived places, have suddenly and finally gained access to the most basic essentials and necessities. And that has been driven universally by liberalization. I actually agree with the point that a lot of this has been driven by governments, right? Um, I think we have to look at capitalism as a, a joint venture, as it were, between the free market and a, a particular cap like form of, uh, of capitalist state. And they have often, over the last 40 years, whether you look at Thatcherism in Britain, Reaganism in America, you know, various, you know, Pinochet in Chile, right? States have worked with markets to actually break down um, protections that you, had existed so for what, you, So what's, what's your model, Grace? What country would My be an example My model is, is real democracy. And this is the thing but, that... No, this is what, I mean, a specific country. This is, the, this is what, Dem, what uh, Jeremy Corbyn and, and, and Bernie Sanders are promising, is something that has not existed before. But that's what they're promising. Diego's socialism. asking for a real-world example, because often critics of socialism will say, Venezuela, Cuba at the extreme end, North Korea. Is there real-world examples that people like yourself can point to and say, no, this works, what I'm there calling are, for, there are plenty this of, works? There are plenty of examples of, you know, social democratic states, if not socialist states, providing much higher standards of living for the majority of their citizens. That's something that I think we can... What's one? Or, 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 all the Nordic countries, right? You know, well, they have... It's, it's interesting you bring them up. They have higher rates of union... Let me, the, the, let me tell you something. They have better uh, no. health outcomes, better education outcomes, all these sorts of okay, things. OK, Diego, um, a, few, a few things that people don't realise about Nordic economies. Sweden has the highest wealth inequality in all of Europe. It's privatised the schools, it's privatised a lot of the hospitals. I agree with you, it has very high standards of living and a very large safety net that helps a lot of people, but it's not the picture that Bernie Sanders and is selling what I was us. going to say was that those countries have historically had, you know, much better outcomes because they've had a bigger role for the state in providing all of these things. That's not but quite right. over the last right. 30, no. 40 years, those uh, protections, pub uh, social institutions, public services have been eroded. If you look at the most prosperous countries in the world, they have the rule of law, they have very well-protected property rights, and they have a big role for markets even within the provision of public services. And if you look I'm at talking the most about New Zealand, the world, Australia, provide... Nordic, or Nordic countries, Germany, France even, they're beginning to adopt those yeah. models as well. Diego, isn't, they Diego isn't the problem, one thing I often find when people in the US in particular have this debate about capitalism, socialism, they say, oh, socialism's really bad, Venezuela, and then you say, what about the Nordic countries? And then you say, oh, actually, they're capitalist countries just like us. When you can't have it both ways. If they're so similar to the US, then why doesn't the US do what those countries are doing in terms of healthcare regulation? Well, it does to a very large extent and usually much more You think more the US economy is similar to the Norwegian economy? In many ways, it is, yeah. I mean, it's open to trade. It has free capital mobility. It, it doesn't have the same of level of healthcare. It doesn't have the same level of wages, it. minimum wage. Maybe the taxpayer pays for more healthcare in Sweden, but the provision of healthcare is in many ways the same as it is in the United there States. There is a point That's there. Not true, which but is it is. It's not universal in the United States. There is a point there, which is that both systems are capital systems, as in they are uh, economies in which um, there is private ownership of the most important uh, resources we need to produce stuff, um, and that those resources are used to maximise profit, and that is supported by the state. What socialists today are arguing for is a step beyond that is socialised ownership of all the stuff we need to produce things, and is democracy in our economy, as well as in our politics. That means worker ownership of firms, it means, you know, workers actually making the decisions about what we should be producing, it means democratic control of our public services, it means a democratic... Just to be clear, are you system. saying that the public, the government should own all public services, all utilities? I'm saying that there should be different models of ownership, so there should be nationalised ownership of some things that are natural monopolies, but primarily we need an economy that is run by people for people. We, we have tried this before, right? I mean, worker ownership was something that was tried in socialist Yugoslavia. It was originally the model for the Soviet Union, and steadily 
the state took over more and more roles. In Yugoslavia, it was simply deeply inefficient. It's an economy that was stagnant for decades. It, this is not a novel argument, and it's a very inefficient way, the evidence suggests, to organize an economy. It's because just, workers just a quick, don't want the answer. Just okay, before we run out of time, I do have to ask a big question before we run out of time. How much does climate change play a role in it's, your argument? It's completely changed the game. It is going to be impossible to solve the climate crisis under capitalism, and it provides so much urgency to those movements that are actually seeking to provide a better life I for their children. I couldn't disagree more, Mehdi and, and Grace. I have to say, you look at the environmental record of the socialist economies all across history, and it's been terribly poor. Lake Baikal in Russia is completely drained as a result of state management of but the economy. Again, Why? no one's saying no, state socialism. Me. No one's saying we're well, going you, you to the USSR. You weren't, you weren't this is about democracy. But, but they weren't able to give but a single but example but of a the greatest, But the, the greatest polluter in human history, the United States of America, the world's most famous capitalist economy, you wouldn't deny that. Well, I mean, but look at the evolution of carbon emissions in the United States in the last 10 years. It's innovation driven by private markets. Do you, uh, making us just, I just have to put this on the record here. I know you work for the Cato Institute, which is funded by the Koch brothers. You, you believe in man-caused climate change? Of course. OK. Yeah. And you think steps should be taken to tackle it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they will be driven by innovation and private by markets. By capitalism, in the way that they not in spite have. of capital. You think capitalism can solve the climate change it's crisis? The only though... tool, it's the only effective tool to do so if we look at the historical evidence. We'll have to leave it there. Diego, Grace, thank you both for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.